Do you want to know why Sikh migrated to West? Do you want to know how they got involved in the Khalistan movement? Do you want to know why are they still involved in the movement? Do you want to know how deep is the Khalistani rabbit hole in the West? If your answers to any of these questions is yes, then keep watching the last chapter of the Khalistan 2.0 series. In the post-war period, most Western societies have very little population of Sikh immigrants. And with the exception of United Kingdom and the United States, many had very little interest in South Asia. Sikh soldiers serving with the British Army were the first to settle in Canada, the UK and the US. In 1897, after participating in the Golden Jubilee function of Queen Victoria's coronation, Sikh soldiers first came to the west coast of Canada. As a result, most Sikhs in the early 20th century were settled on the Pacific west coast of North America. Many had found a route through Hong Kong and Shanghai ports where they worked in the security apparatus of the British colonial administration. The educated strata of Sikh came to study in the universities of both UK and the US while most of the educated Sikhs went back to newly independent India. As the British government opened its immigration doors, Sikh soldiers came in large numbers to settle in England after the World War II. In late 1950s and early 1960s, a limited number of trained and educated Sikh professionals started westward journey as new opportunities opened in expanding western economies. The large migration pattern started after the success of green revolution technologies in the Punjab. I will tell you that you are not going to be able to do it. do it. do in the early 1970s, a large number of unemployed and semi-employed youth came and settled mostly in Canada but also in England and the US. In the 1980s and 1990s, they were followed by one of large waves of Sikh immigrants in history. While earlier Sikh immigrants joined anti-British colonial movements in the UK and in North America, the politics of post-independent India witnessed a new trend. Although Sikh diaspora's numbers were too small to make any impact on post-1947 political developments, the seeds of a separatist movement were sown. A small segment of Sikh immigrants' community started turning the wheel of patriotic movement in the opposite direction. As a result, in the early 1960s, the Sikh homeland movement started under the leadership of a London-based Sikh immigrant, Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan. Pakistan's ISI states that the agency supported the Jagjit Singh Chauhan-led movement against India. But it was later transformed into Khalistan movement under the leadership of Sardar Charan Singh Panchi, a member of Akali Dal Sant in UK. Details of which you have probably seen in the Khalistan 2.0 Chapter 2 Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan of this series. It had the imprint of classical Cold War era proxy war against India and its non-aligned foreign policy. Apart from ISI's involvement in Sikh separatism, a tacit approval came from the United States and its Cold War allies like Britain in the form of visa-free entry to Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan in US even though his Indian passport was cancelled by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Also, US Sikh relations came under radar for the second time when Dr. Chauhan published a half page advertisement in the New York Times on 11th October 1971, making a case for Khalistan. After losing Bangladesh in 1971, the Pakistani regime reinvigorated its policy of playing Sikh card against India. Instrument of Surrender. Dhaka, 1971. The 
Pakistan Eastern Command agrees to surrender all Pakistan armed forces in Bangladesh to Lieutenant General Jagjit Singh Arora. General Niazi has surrendered to a Sikh army commander, Lieutenant General Arora, which did not bode well for the Khalistan movement. As it showed a Sikh at the top position in a so called Hindu India leading Hindu army. Meantime, some right-wing politicians in Washington were not pleased with India's growing ties with the Soviet Union. Especially after the conclusion of Indo-USSR Treaty of Friendship, contacts between Jagji Singh Chauhan and US-based Ganga Singh Dillon increased under the watchful eyes of US and British officials. <laughs> तो मैं कह सकती हूँ कि एक एक खून का खतरा जितना मेरा है वो एक एक खून एक भारत को जीवित करेगा The new impetus for separatist activities was provided by demands included in the Akali Dal's Anandpur Sahib resolutions. While this resolution demanded a highly centralized federation in India, however, Indira Gandhi and Congress party dubbed this as a separatist document. The decade of 1970s witnessed the success of green revolution technologies on the one hand and the elimination of small and medium landholders on the other. This decade witnessed the rise of land mafia in India. It was also a decade in which educated and semi-educated youth belonging to farming families started migrating abroad, especially to Canada and the US. While majority of these youths belonged to Naxalite or some other left-wing student and youth groups, there were many who belonged to All India Sikh Student Federation (AISSF). It was the youth from AISSF who became easy target for Khalistani propaganda. Unable to return home because of brutal economic situation in India and faced with open racism in Western societies. these youth were receptive to anti india feelings the khalistani leaders preached that punjab was a victim of colonization process of delhi government and sikhs would not be able to live and prosper in a hindu majority state of india towards the end of 1970s a series of local regional and international events gave an impetus to sikh separatist movement first and foremost After losing both state and central elections, the Congress leaders like Gyani Jail Singh and Sanjay Gandhi started playing sick card to weaken their opponents in Akali Dal and Jansan. Secondly, various factions of Akali Dal became more radicalized in the politics of one-upmanship. Strong ties of friendship between the two countries. Despite the temporary imposition of martial law, the Shah's new government appears determined to press ahead with liberal reform. It is from the mosques that opposition to the Shah is being led by puritanical Shiite Muslims. The religious zealots want to return to the constitution of 1906, which would ensure all legislation conforms with Islamic law. Thirdly, after Iranian Revolution and Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The southwestern Asia became a center for Cold War rivalry. The stage was set for the beginning of Sikh terrorist movement. While Sikh separatists in all major western capitals played a vital role in propagating and supporting terrorist movement in the state of Punjab, Sikh diaspora of Canada, however, played a central role in barbaric violence. The most prominent figure in this cycle of violence among immigrant Sikhs was Talwinder Singh Parmar. He along with Sukhdev Singh Babbar founded a terrorist organization called Babbar Khalsa in 1978. Seizing upon anti-Nirankari sentiments among Sikh masses, the Babbar Khalsa first directed its activities against the followers of Nirankari movement and its leadership. In 1981, Parmar organized Babbar Khalsa in Canada with its headquarters in Vancouver. Its leaders and followers collected money to support violent politics of assassination in Punjab. The following year, Indian government requested Canadian government to extradite Parmar, but Canada refused. Meantime, the traditional leaders of Khalistani movement in the UK and the US continued to lobby for official support from western capitals 
as Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan became a frequent guest in Washington DC. Indian government launched a formal complaint with the State Department. As a result, US refused to grant any visa to Dr. Chauhan in 1984 as he was permanent resident in Britain. However, Senator Jesse Helms found a way to circumvent this ban by inviting Chauhan to testify before the United States Senate Agricultural Committee. While some politicians in the US and other western capitals remained friendly towards six separatists, the officials of these countries did not make any public pronouncements in favor of Khalistan. During his May 1984 visit to India, Vice President George Bush apparently informed the Indian government that CIA was not conspiring with the Sikh terrorists against India. This marked one of only a few departures from US policy against confirming or denying reported CIA activities. Pakistani help alone could not have continued to foment trouble in Punjab. Two major events in 1984, armies entering Golden Temple and the massacres of Sikh men and women in the aftermath of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's assassination forced even ordinary Sikh to question the real motives of Indian government. Sikhs turned out in thousands in all western capitals to protest government's action in Amritsar. Government's rational did not convince ordinary Sikh that it was necessary to remove terrorists from the Golden Temple. In addition, the massacres of Sikhs in Delhi and other cities across India in the aftermath of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination created feelings of alienation among Sikh diaspora. As separatists capitalized on this growing alienation, the violent aspect of the movement took over previously peaceful protests in Western countries. Sikh temples were captured by the Khalistani extremist elements, which gave them ready-made platforms for separatist propaganda and enormous amount of wealth to fund terrorist activities. While all Western countries witnessed an upsurge of violence in Sikh diaspora, Canada became the hub of extremism. Sikh separatists planted two bombs in Air India flights in June 1985, while one exploded at Narita Airport in Tokyo as the bags were being transferred to Air India flight killing two baggage handlers. The other exploded over the Atlantic killing all 329 passengers in the Air India flight 182. What was considered a distance problem of India suddenly became a domestic issue for Canada. After the Air India bombing incident, the security forces started taking this threat more seriously. It also split the movement as various segments of the separatist movement questioned the barbarity of such terrorist tactics. Two leading propagandists and insider of Khalistan movement, Tarsam Singh Purawal, editor Des Pardes, and Tara Singh Hire, editor Indo Canadian Times, turned away from this movement and started urging Sikh masses to disassociate themselves from terrorist elements in the community. Since they were also witnesses in the Air India trial, the Khalistani elements assassinated both editors. The separatist movement abroad was being fueled by an influx of a large number of refugees and immigrants from Punjab. Many youngsters involved in terrorist activities managed to flee abroad and claim refugee status. Western countries' liberal refugee policies became a haven for separatist elements to avoid punishments for their deeds in Punjab. As a result, Every Sikh militant grew from Bhindrawali Tigers forces to Khalistan Commander forces, from Khalistan Liberation forces to Khalistan Zindabad force established their branches in western countries. In addition, the old established groups such as Babur Khalsa International BKI, International Sikh Youth Federation ISYF, Dal Khalsa and Akhan Kirtani Jatha continued to function. For official lobbying in Western capitals, the old Council of Khalistan continued to function in the US and the UK. Its pattern was copied by World Sikh Organization WSO, established in Canada in 1984. Terrorist organizations were directly involved in violence. The Khalistan Council and WSO became their official apologists and main anti-India lobbyists. 
as senseless killings, rapes and kidnappings continued in Punjab. The victims of such violence started opposing separatists. Migrants and refugees of 1980s and 1990s from Punjab also included victims of both terrorist and police violence in Punjab. अनकी कोई ऐसी बात नहीं है तो यूके गवर्नमेंट को अलर्ट करना चाहते हैं कि ये टेररिस्ट हैं इनको हिंदुस्तान के हवाले करो इनको बिल्कुल परमिशन ना दो कि जो वहां खालिस्तान के मेमोरेंडम की खालिस्तान की बात कर रहे हैं ये बिल्कुल यहां पे नहीं होनी चाहिए द एजुकेटेड पीपल लिविंग इन वेस्टर्न सोसाइटीज अबाउट द ट्रू नेचर ऑफ द सो कॉल्ड लिबरेशन मूवमेंट फॉर खालिस्तान gun targeting individuals belonging to more than a dozen terrorist organizations were heavily involved in intimidation and robberies rapes kidnappings and loot of ordinary villagers this violent period finally came to an end in 1993 the newly elected government of chief minister bayan singh took decisive measures under its police chief kps gill to eliminate all terrorist organizations and restore normalcy in Punjab as sick masses had started questioning the barbarity of tactics pursued by the terrorists in Punjab and abroad the separatists had to find a new strategy to continue the movement to create an independent state of Khalistan it came in the name of human rights and politics of grievance The stories of true nature of terrorists that emerged after 1993 did not please the protagonists of Khalistan abroad. Instead of a liberation movement it had turned into a camp of robbers and rapists. The sympathy that had emerged among Sikhs towards separatists in 1984 turned into anger. Individuals involved in the militant movement abroad had become enormously rich by looting Sikh temples and collected funds in the name of fighting liberation struggle. Sikh image had suffered enormously as a result of terrorist activities. A return of normalcy in the Punjab demoralized all separatists in various western societies where Sikh were seen with suspicion. Repeating once again our top story, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev has been removed from power and there are tanks now in the streets of Moscow. In the meantime, the collapse of Soviet Union not only meant an end of Cold War, but also an end of Afghan war. Western attention turned away from Southwest Asia and focused on new hot spots like Balkans and former Eastern European states. India was no longer in the wrong Cold War camp. Liberalization of Indian economy was viewed as a positive step away from old Soviet-style command economy. This presented enormous opportunities for Western companies eager for fresh markets. This does not, however, mean that Western countries had any better understanding of threats of terrorism India faced in Kashmir. and had faced in the Punjab It came after 9/11 2001 bombings of twin towers in the USA New dawn of awareness brought a sharp focus on all forms of terrorism As a result western capital started the process of banning terrorist organizations Canada the UK and the US banned for Babbar Khalsa and International Sikh Youth Federation Although individuals associated with these associations remain free the situation made it difficult to regroup and carry out same old politics In this new situation the umbrella groups like Khalistan Council and WSO started playing an important role in politics of Sikh separatism New strategy focused on highlighting human rights violations in India in general and the Punjab in particular Important remembrance days like Operation Blue Star in June and Sikh massacres in November became the main focal points of new strategy. All separatist organizations and separatist controlled Sikh temples are heavily involved in highlighting the issues of injustice and human rights. It is ironic however that they present these demands for justice and rights in halls and temples filled with pictures of terrorists. 
who were involved in murders, rapes and plunder. As international community is waging a war against terrorism, it is difficult for Sikh separatists to promote and defend violent methods, as was the case in the past. Further, the new pro-India approach of various Western countries has made it difficult for Sikhs to use these countries for anti-India activities. The old Cold War mentality has disappeared and a new era of strategic partnerships with India has begun. Washington now views India as a sister secular democracy with rule of law, which faces many problems faced by open Western societies. Strategic partnerships are emerging between India and the West. India has a unique strategic character. It will not be an ally of the United States. It, will, it has a, a desire to be an independent, powerful state. It, is a, it will be another great power. As Sikh militancy disappeared in India in mid-1990s, it continues to exist in Sikh diaspora. In the changed environment of post-9-11 world in Western capitals, however, the separatist elements are unable to advocate open violence against India. This does not mean the project is abandoned. We still see Pakistan-sponsored Khalistani referendum events in US, UK, Canada and Australia. Most important one being the blockade of PM Modi's carcade by Sikh for Justice Group, which you have probably seen in Chapter 1, Happy New Year of the Khalistan 2.0 series. From the time it started as a minor movement for Sikh homeland in 1960s to present, the movement has witnessed various ups and downs among immigrant Sikhs. Indian government is understandably concerned as Sikh diaspora represents a large portion of vibrant Sikh community in India. Nearly 2 million Sikhs out of a total population of 22 million reside abroad. 4 million Sikh reside in other parts of India while 16 million live in the state of Punjab. A Sikh diaspora that represents nearly 10% of total Sikh population has a strong voice, especially with its presence in Western liberal democracies. Notwithstanding its strength, only a small portion of Sikh immigrant population support the separatist movement. However, modern means of communication along with guaranteed liberties and freedoms in Western societies have provided the separatists with a louder voice. These anti-India sentiments are shared by Khalistani protagonists abroad. At every opportune moment, the separatist Sikhs do not fail to praise Pakistan and its anti-India activities. In fact, the establishment of the state of Pakistan on the basis of religion had provided basic rationale for a separate Sikh state. This convergence of interest between the failed Pakistani state and the separatist Sikhs will continue to fuel the fires of separatism until the rogue state itself is broken into four parts. After all, someone has rightfully said, He who digs a pit for others falls in himself. <laughs>